Guten Abend aus Berlin. Good evening from Berlin. I'm Steffen. I'm the local chapter coordinator of the Rafa Cycling Club over here. I'm right in the middle of the clubhouse. We had a great indoor early bird session this morning on the way to our RCC championships next week. So the guys over here are very motivated. And some weeks ago, uh, one of our ride leaders and members, Reese Howell, he suggested to give us some tips and tricks of how to do well in a race because it's not only about the uh, legs, it's also about some tactics and some things you need to know. So I'm gonna have a shower now and I'm looking forward to the skill session on Swift in the virtual world with Reese. Enjoy, leave some comments, ask questions, and maybe see you next week in the race. Good evening, um, or good morning, depending on where you are uh, joining us from. I am coming at you live from the Rafa Berlin Clubhouse. Uh, Stefan was supposed to meet me here, but um, I think he's still in the shower. I can hear some some singing um, coming very faintly from downstairs. Uh, but anyway, I'm here. I'm going to talk to you about um, Zwift racing. I'm going to run you through a quick presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to just drop them in the comments. And when Stefan gets back, <clears throat> hopefully dressed, um, we'll run through those and uh, we'll have a small uh, chat at the very end um, or if it's something which is really relevant then he might uh, interrupt. So without further ado I'm going to crack on with the presentation. So, so how to be a pro in a Zwift race. So this comes with a caveat. So number one is that I cannot um, talk on behalf of your own physical abilities. You're still gonna have to pump out some serious watts if you're going to win a race. But hopefully with some of these tips that we talk about, um, it will definitely help you improve, if not instantly, but over time. Caveat number two is that this is a, by no means um, kind of a dig at professional riders who are coming into uh, Zwift racing. Uh, basically because like myself, I've been racing on the platform for four years, I've already made all of the mistakes and there I see a lot of people making the mistakes which I already made a long time ago. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of fun basically. So, but you know, as we'll see, there's plenty of tips which you can use and then also even um, someone new, even a professional could use. So quick introduction, um, so who am I? A very brief history of Zwift racing, um, making a team, so specifically our Canyon ZCC team, getting the basics right, um, some pro tips. Uh, well, then we're gonna review a race, which we did uh, recently, and then just to finish off with what should you do next? So who am I? Thanks, Beanie Man. Um, I am partnerships manager at Canyon by day. Uh, by night, I am the founder of the Canyon ZTC eSports team. I'm also the team manager and um, DS on all, for all of our races. By weekend or by early bird, I am the RCC ride leader in Berlin. Um, some of you possibly have already ridden with me on Zwift um, as I've done four of the Rafa Berlin early bird editions now. Uh, if you have joined, then thank you for that. That was great. It's always great when people from all around the world join our, our rides. And I've been on Zwift for five years, had my anniversary a few weeks back, and I've been racing on Zwift for four years. So have a good idea of how the platform has developed and how e-racing has basically grown in that time. So... This is, so I'm gonna give you a brief history of, of Zwift racing. This is what it used to be like when I started. Everybody would go to the start line under this arch and then wait until a clock, you would all have a clock open. Then it would say, right now it's eight o'clock, go. And you'd go on this manic kind of sprint. So nothing has changed there. 
and there was no there, so there was no pens you just had to try and figure out where everyone from your group is Nathan Guerra here from Zwift Community Live he's been doing the commentary for yeah best, best part of four years he was there when I did my first race so um, that's kind of what it was like here's an actual screen grab from my first race so you can see here I'm there with uh, my Canyon kit with a slightly wonky logo on the side and then there is also this zip wheel here. So even wheels weren't round um, at this time in Zwift. So if you know what shape this is, um, you leave it in the comments. Maybe Stefan, when he gets back, he'll throw you a bead on uh, as a prize. Um, but this is a hexadecagon. Hopefully I said that right. Obviously the platform has massively improved in that time. We now have race pens. It's, 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 completely different, but the community created uh, Zwift Racing and they've continued to kind of like develop it over time. So the Canyon Esports team. Um, so we were the first professional e-racing team uh, racing at the highest level. We launched um, January uh, last year uh, and we've been racing uh, ever since. Uh, we were the winners of the inaugural KISS Community League. Um, as well as many other like Zwift Classics, Callus League, um, which either put on by Zwift or put on by the um, community itself. We have six men and six women based all around the world from the US to New Zealand. That's one of the amazing things about having an e-racing team, um, whether it's a professional one like ours or whether it's, you know, just like a club, you can be based anywhere in the world and ride together. And so our team is, is no different. And we're supported by Canyon, Wahoo, Noon, Ceramic Speed, InfraCrank, and Training Peak. So we have a bunch of different partners who help us out and provide equipment for the, for the team to race on. And uh, yeah, when we launched, we did this. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures now. We, we launched and did this photo shoot. Uh, thank you, Ingo from Wahoo, for helping us out. We worked with this guy, Rene, who's also based here in Berlin. And... Um, yeah, so I wanted to, when we were designing the kit, I worked with Alton who um, designed the Canyon Shram racing kit. And I wanted to basically pair two of my passions, cycling and 90s rave music. <laughs> and so we kind of, it, it was fitting to kind of do a photo shoot in, a, um, in an abandoned brewery in this case, but it looks like it's a warehouse. And uh, yeah, it was, it was about pairing basically these two kind of quite different things and putting them together and somehow it felt quite futuristic to do it in this way. Um, so yeah, so I'm just run through some of the pictures that we have um, of the team showing off our kit, which um, has been received really well. So yeah, and we made some of these newspapers, which were, um, yeah, when the, when the rave scene came about, there was a lot of hysteria and I kind of wanted to play with that a little bit because um, there was a lot of hysteria about how ridiculous e-racing is. And it's amazing how things have changed just in the last, um year basically since then yeah and we also made some some rave posters <laughs> of course um so now i'm just going to show you a quick video it's of one of our riders Lino Vuyasin. um zwift produced this it's really nicely made and i think it just represents everything that the the team is about so he could say it better than than i could in this instance he just showed us who the best of the best is What a racer. There it is, Fiasi coming over the top. Hey, bonjour. I live here with my girlfriend's family and few pets, I would say. I was the kind of, of child who was passionate about sport. I started racing when I was 14 years old and it was open categories with every age. The race was two hours and I was fighting cramps. It was all about trying to reach that finish line. Cyclocross is a big discipline here in Belgium. It's different than mountain biking because here most of the, of the tracks are flat. I was in a point in my cycling career, I would say, and I, I saw Zwift. I joined Rafa Cycling Club and ended up riding in Vancouver. And yeah, it was pretty funny because I was an underdog and I won that race. I won $10,000. My Zwift experience has changed a lot since then because when I started, I was like 
on a really basic setup, but now with the upgrade, I have a smart trainer, I have all the wow equipment, thanks to the team. Zulf Racing is kind of a game changer. It gives me opportunities I would never expect. When you are on the trainer, you are risk free, so you can give you the best of yourself. I remember the Tour de Zwift with Bologna. I, I was the last climb, I just gave it all in the last K just for the win. Something I would never do outside because I would be scared to crash. My comeback story in Zwift was in Amsterdam. It was so crazy because it was a community race and I had the Bluetooth dropout. A dropout situation for Austin. it looks like here. He's got, probably got his hands in the air, like what is going on? No power for 20 to 30 seconds. It, in my mind it was hollow. Everything was over for me. And then the power came back and I just tried to ride as, as hard as possible. Here's the shot here, trying to get back, but it's 21 seconds, never give up the ghost. We'll see if he can make this happen. Try to come back on each group to the lead group and finally be able to sprint. And I won that race, it was like, it was amazing. It's gonna be Canyon ZCC across the line. He made the impossible happen. I think the best thing that happened to me uh, on Zwift was to be able to join Canyon ZCC. It's, it's like a family and we know each other so well now. It's really a pleasure to race with these guys. Our biggest rivals is of course indoor specialist. All the races against them are so close. It's sometimes 0.1 of a second. You never know what can happen and that's so fun. Yeah, funnily, <clears throat> funnily enough, um, so Lena was the first rider which um, actually joined the team and we were both, uh, it was, we were talking, I don't know, like three years ago or something, it was a long time ago about creating a team and we met on an RCC racing group on Facebook. So we were both RCC members looking to sort of, he was looking for a proper team to race for and I was looking to create a team. So. Um, and that race he talks about where he got that dropout was um, still, I get kind of goosebumps. Uh, it's weird to talk about a, an e-race and getting goosebumps for it, but it was a totally insane race. Um, yeah, and he's just a great, um, I guess, role model for, 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 for e-racing. So now I'm going to just talk about some of the, the basics. So some of you who've already done some e-racing on, on Zwift, some of this stuff you'll already know for people who are completely new it's might not be obvious to you so i'm just going to run for it because um it's it's definitely useful to know if you if you don't already so number one definitely is to sign up to zwiftpower.com on zwiftpower this is where all of the official results actually occur um it'll filter out anyone who might have been racing um above the uh, what per category limits um, or who, so they might be cheating, they might have a, um, they might be in the wrong category, they might have the um, equipment miscalibrated, something like that. And not only that, it's just also good to collate all of your racing results in one place. And yeah, this is also where you can create like a team and track everyone's um, information. So you can just see on, on, on my profile, it says Team Canyon. So, and I can go in and see what all of my uh, riders are, are doing. So, but this is really easy. It connects um, via the API to, um, to, to Zwift. So once you've set it up, you know, it just, it just runs and pulls all the results in. So if you want, if you're serious about racing, do this. It takes like a couple of minutes maybe to do and, and you're good to go. So uh, my second tip would probably be to regularly update your weight. So, um, as in the example of this picture, I use a, a Withings um, scale. You can also connect your Withings account to Zwift. So then it automatically updates uh, Zwift. And I think via uh, if this, then that, you can also update your, your Strava. So it's important, it's important to do, especially if, uh, if like me, I start the year weighing eight kilograms more than I currently do, <laughs> then it's really worth, worth doing it. Um, and also, that also helps you calculate your uh, watt per kilogram. So, you know, what's your FTP and divide that by your weight. And that gives you a good idea of what category you should be entering. Um, so that also saves you from uh, potentially entering the wrong category. And on Zwift Power, if you erase out of category, then you might get disqualification or you might get a little symbol which says you need to upgrade your, your cap. Um, so it just saves any 
any problems there potentially. The worst thing is to do a race and then find out you've been disqualified um, or you, you get an upgrade uh, symbol. So um, yeah, definitely wear a heart rate monitor. So again, this is one of those things which potentially could get you disqualified from a race. Um, it's not necessary for, for all races, but it's just generally a really good habit um, to, to have. And it's also useful just for racing to see what your heart rate is. If you roughly know what your heart rate zones are, it's a good indicator to see, you know, whether you should ease off the power or whether you can go a little bit harder. So at the end of the day, the more data you can have, the, the better basically, which will help you decide um, how you should be racing. Uh, calibrate your equipment. So yeah, do spin downs on your trainer, um, calibrate your power meters. Uh, this is also super important because that could be another reason why you might get disqualified from a race or even better use an infra crank um, like our team uses and it calibrates itself. So it's basically a foolproof um, solution. So that's why we, one of the reasons why we picked that. Uh, a fan. So this is like the, the most important one probably uh, out of all of the basics is get a fan and get a really strong one. I see a lot of people who ride with um, a tiny little fan and it's just, it's not going to do anything. And it makes a huge difference with regards to regulating your heart rate. So get a really powerful fan. Um, the Wahoo Headwind is um, really good. There's other ones you can use, but this is the one which our team uses. Uh, and for all of my uh, friends in Germany, feel free to use a leaf blower. Uh, I think every household has one. Um, but that's the level of power that you need from your fan. It needs to really like blow your face off in order to, to stay cool. Um, kind of sticking with the theme. So definitely have a towel. Um, you're gonna need it. You, you're, you, you're gonna get so much hotter riding indoors uh, that you're definitely gonna use a towel. And also um, use a sweatband or a cap to soak up the sweat. So I've actually, I never wear a um, cycling cap um, when I'm outdoors, but I've started wearing them now when I'm, when I'm Zifra. So even that's new for me. And it just makes a huge difference, just reduces how much sweat you get in your face and how many times you have to you know, wipe your brow unnecessarily. Um, and definitely fill up more water bottles than you think you'll need. So for like a 30 kilometer race, I'll probably, I mean, generally I drink a lot, but I'd probably, I'd fill up two large water bottles and I might not finish the second one, but the worst thing that can happen is that you run out of water in one of these races. So because you sweat so much, you really have to constantly hydrate. If you're doing a longer race, you might fill up three or four and just have them stacked maybe on the, on the desk in, in front of you. So whatever you do, more water is better than, than not enough. And it's not going to weigh you down uh, like it would do if you were riding outdoors. So definitely have, have the extra water. So um, yeah, now I want to just talk about like, how do you then take to the next level? What are some of the, the, the most important tips that you, you need to follow? Uh, and so it's just the first off is to say that if you're, if you're new to e-racing, then you're going to get dropped and you just have to accept it. And it's something which all of us go through and you'll be cursing and screaming. And then um, also it's, it, it sucks to basically ride alone and you might not want to even finish the race, but I'd say just, just keep doing, try and recover a bit if you get dropped and just time trial it. And quite often you'll find that other people might have been dropped um, before you and they'll, they'll re eventually gather you and then you have a small group to basically ride with. Um, and just try and remember why it is that you got dropped. It might be because you didn't put in enough effort on a small incline, um, so, and you were, you, or you were slightly out of position, so too far back. So you have to really just keep in mind, try and memorize what it was, and just accept that it genuinely happens to everyone. Um, so yeah, tip number one. This is tip number one purely because it's the first thing you have to do. Um, so prepare to sprint from the start. So I would say, you know, if it's quite a hard race, I'd probably do about 125% of my FTP for about 30 seconds straight out of the gate. As soon as the timer hits zero, I wanna be, I already have my trainer fully spun up and ready to go. Um, so quite often I'll be, when I'm racing myself, I'll be one of the first people out of the gate. Um, 
this is yeah it's just super important and you have to accept as well like once you've done that you've probably done 30 seconds at i don't know 125 and then you might have to do another minute at like 120 115 um yeah and you just have to keep pushing for about a minute and a half i would say um obviously you judge it by the pack because you want to try and conserve energy so if the pack is already started slowing down then yeah you don't need to drive it really hard at the front and conserving energy is one of the most important things on swift um yeah so use the terrain so uh this is an extreme example but this was a really long ride i was doing with some friends and uh because i know the descent really well i was able to nip off and go to the bathroom whilst my avatar was still descending and um, you can see my my, the, my friends who I was riding with, they're still behind me. So you wouldn't do this in a race, of course, but knowing where you can actually take a rest um, is massively important. So knowing that you can free will at that point and we have that slight uh, incline, I knew I had to get back for that point to sprint over it. And I've done races. So I did a really long race on, um, I think it was last weekend, and I made up about 50 places um, just on this descent by knowing how to descend and how to recover. So that links very nicely onto tip three. So learn the routes and also race the routes. So knowing exactly where those inclines and descents are in a particular route is massively important. So um, yeah. It's, it's a case where if you're just starting out, maybe you want to pick races where you it's on Wartopia and you know that route really well. Um, the other part is to also race that route uh, and maybe just keep doing that same race so that you know it off by heart because it's also good to know where are your competitors going to basically put the power down? Where could you potentially get dropped? Um, even on a relatively flat race in uh, Wartopia, it's still possible to, to, to get dropped. So just knowing where it is, where you can put the power down, where you can recover, um, because you'll be back in the pack. Um, yeah, makes, makes a big difference. And for example, so this image I've got here, uh, this is um, Alex West and uh, Philip Diegner. Uh, this is from um, uh, Zwift Classics Bologna from last year. And uh, Alex actually wrecked this route many times over. So he, was, he did his homework like a lot of people wouldn't possibly do. And he knew exactly where, how much power he'd have to put out and where he would make his attack. So he knew it to a T and it worked perfectly well. And he was able to, to basically solo away to, to victory. So one thing to just ride it by yourself and another thing is to race it. So I'd say that repetition is invaluable. And so that's where a lot of, where new people come in, that's where they're gonna make the mistakes. So, uh, and that's where if you've been riding on the platform for many years, you, you have that advantage. So this, this is possibly my number one tip overall um, but obviously if you don't sprint the starts then you, you get dropped straight away um, learn your trainer so this is something which uh, i don't think a lot of people actually talk about so um, figuring out exactly how your trainer reacts when you're riding it is massively important it's not you can't just go from the road and then think that your trainer is going to react the same way because it, it's just not so um, our team will ride on the um, Wahoo Kicker um, 18, as it's referred to, and this has a really heavy flywheel and you have to really, you have to learn how to get the most out of it. So in some instances, it can feel like a harder trainer to ride, but if you, if you know your way around it, you know that, you know, for example, if you're descending on a long descent, that flywheel is going to slow down. And when you get to the bottom, it's going to feel like you're doing a standing start, basically. So it's knowing that actually before I get to the bottom, I'm going to have to start spinning up that, that flywheel again. So when I hit the flat section, I've already got that kind of inertia in the flywheel going. Um, and it, it's knowing to do that. So uh, it makes a huge difference. And it kind of means you're putting a little bit less stress uh, on your body. And it also just makes it feel a lot nicer. And of course, there's many different trainers out there. So you have to get used to how each different one works. Even there can be a difference between using AMP Plus or Bluetooth, the, the sensation can feel slightly different. So get the setup which, which works for you. Um, and yeah, again, more time you spend on it, the, the better you'll get at actually riding your, your trainer. Uh, tip five, get a team, get a DS. Okay, the DS is a bit of a luxury, um, but anyone can join a team. There's tons of uh, community teams. As I mentioned, there's an RCC um, racing team. So there's RCC members who have already been racing on Zwift. Uh, so yeah, that might be an option for you, or there might be someone 
like local um he'd be interested in. there's loads of teams um they're always teams are always looking to recruit and it's just nice to be part of something kind of bigger so our team's like a closed team so we only have those 12 riders at the moment but lots of other teams have hundreds of, of members so having that kind of um community element i think is really important and then also um like with our team it's a bit smaller but even other teams do this you know you're able to talk about what are our team tactics and it allows you to kind of react differently in a race scenario so a lot of people think there aren't any race uh, team tactics in Zwift racing and I can see that when there's a lot of races which end in bunch sprints but as we'll see when we do the race review uh, having having team team strategy and having a, a, a DS who's watching the race and providing real-time information actually is really kind of invaluable um, in these scenarios so first thing find a team I'd say if, if you can get a DS uh tip number six is getting the right bike so I, I see a lot of people making this mistake so even even road pros coming in um and it, it find the right bike for the for the terrain so if it's a flatter route take an aero bike so i've got the canyon aero and i've got the super nine disc wheel on the back um this is this is pretty much the fastest setup which which we would use um climbing bike so i've got an ultimate with some mv ses um super light wheels so if it's going to be a really hilly route, if we're going to finish up um, outdoors or something like that, then I would use this. If you've been lucky enough to get the lightweight uh, wheels, uh, which you randomly get um, sometimes if you go up out, out to Zwift, then you would you would use those. Um, I think our team riders have nearly all the wheels, so it's it's they can pick whatever they want. I don't have that luxury. Um, or you can uh, if you're racing a gravel race. So if you're in that jungle circuit then you would use a mountain bike like the, the Lux because that's actually um, works out being a lot quicker. Um, so some instances you might want to use a gravel bike, but the road bikes are you know a lot slower. So making sure that you find the right bike for the right environment um, makes a lot of sense. And sometimes you have to weigh it up because there might just be one climb and you go like, well, do I use a slightly slower bike for you know, whatever, 50%, but most of the attacks are going to happen on just on that one climb. So you have to figure it out. And sometimes it's having a combination of the, of the both, but uh, definitely getting the right bike. And a lot of people will ask, well, oh, the Tron bike's the best bike. And that's not actually true. So if, you, if, you, if you're unsure, check um, Zwift Insider. They have a list of um, all of the bikes and wheels and how good they are for climbing. Um, and Chris Pritchard, I saw, also did a video um a few days ago and it was the best bikes which you can use um if you're only if you're below level 10 so even if you're just starting out and you haven't reached the upper echelons of zwift rankings there's still some things you can do so don't think it's just for if you've unlocked all of the bikes okay so now i'm going to do a race review so the the, the race which we're going to look at here it's a i've made a really condensed version of um i think it's about a half an hour race and this is a race for Alps in Phoenix put on uh, with Matthew Vanderpoel and, and the whole team. And they took on eight e-racing teams, so including ours, uh, which firstly I have to completely commend them for. Like that e-racing is not their speciality and they decided to do it with, you know, specialists, which I think is really cool because in the end, it was just an amazing um, advert for how good e-racing can can actually be so um yeah respect to Alps and Phoenix for doing that so so yeah so these are the teams which entered um so most of these teams are based in Europe there was a Zwift All-Stars team who had a few riders um some ex-pros a couple of guys Simon Richardson from um and Connor Dunn from GCN and so here's the start so this is from this is from Lino's live stream actually so you're gonna see Bang, he's the first one off the line. Here you can see, um, I think it's Ollie Jones and Alex West also. So three of our riders at the very front of the race, um, pushing really hard. So, I mean, actually, Lino's putting out probably more than 125% uh, there. But you see this, all the other riders all move up and our team riders slowly start to slip back because they pretty much know they, they're there now, right? They're in the pack. So as long as they maintain a pretty steady amount of watts, then they're gonna, they're gonna stay here. So let everybody else do the work, basically. 
and, and now Lino's riding below threshold. So um, you'll see in a minute, I think he gets a bit bored of that. So um, we speed it up a little bit and um, you can see he's he's dropped a ghost power up and he's just powered off the front and you can see he gets a little bit bored. Where is everyone? Oh, and then he'll catch him. So jumping to what happened at the back. So there's three Alps and Phoenix riders there who have already been dropped at the very beginning. And I think that's purely just because they didn't expect it to go out as hard as it did, because of course that doesn't happen um, on the road. So um, yeah, they were caught out a little bit. So here we're just gonna speed it up. You'll see there's some guy right at the back. There you go, free wheeled that bit. So he took a bit of a rest, which is pretty pretty smart. So we're focusing on Matthew Van Der Poel here. Now he does a lot of riding at the front. Um, and you'll see that our guys, they're kind of like a bit further back, getting that draft. There is a drafting effect into it. So and you can see Matthew and his, his team riders really drilling at the front on this flexion. They don't have to um, at all. So you get this left hand turn here and we'll slow it down. And um, yeah, this is just a shot to um, Dubon, who is Riding outside, which I would advise against. I think it's better to try and be inside somewhere cool and have the fan blowing on you. Um, so we'll speed it back up again. And we're gonna focus on where Matthew is. So here, right at the back of this group. And um, it's just bad positioning. Cause even though he's one of the strongest riders in the world, if you're not in the right position on a Zwift race, you know, you're really gonna suffer. So here's, here's it from Lino's view, same climb. And uh, he's here, he's 30, 30th position or something, and he moves up and up and up and up and up. And you'll look, when we get to the peak, there's five of our team riders over the climb first. And they basically know that there's a, there's a slight decline um, straight afterwards. So you know that you can get that bit of rest there. So it's worth pushing harder than perhaps you would do otherwise, um, just knowing that you'll get that bit of recovery and you've, you've made it basically. So. Here, I don't know how many riders there are here. There's probably about 30, 30 odd riders. You'll see it from this angle. All of these guys have all been dropped now, basically. Um, that's how brutal a Zwift race is. If you're not in that front group, um, you're unlikely to kind of make it back. So here's the Bond. He's still um, did pretty good there. But again, he's out of position. He's at the back of this climb. Again, you have to be going into the bottom of this climb right at the front. Everyone's dropped their power-ups at the right time. Um, and you'll see again, you see Lino knew exactly what he was going to do. And he basically did a, I don't know, it's about 80% sprint power. And again, here's Mathieu, his, his race is over. Um, they look at it from Lino's view again. So going into the base of that climb and he's right at the front. You can see Phillips there as well, just sprinting it. The draft rider next to him, he drops his aero power-up, which is, Quite smart, I guess, because you know, you're gonna have uh, two more laps after this one. So he knows he's gonna pick up another power up at the top of um, under this arch here. So um, you see Lino sits back down again in his saddle and he knows again, there's another descent after this section. And um, yeah, so he's just doing 200 watts. So, and this is basically an A race. Um, so yeah, fast forward a little bit. Uh, so this is the main group now. So we're going up to the last uh, climb. It's not listed, uh, it's called Governor Street. And um, here, this this section, I think everyone was basically, we know it's a bit longer and a bit less steep. So you know you get a bit of recovery. You see there's only about 30 riders left here. And, and we were talking about it as we came over. I think Ollie Jones mentioned it as well. He was like, this is the bit to attack. If we ever feel like attacking this flat section, because everyone will have been racing really hard on those three different climbs everyone will want to break there so that's exactly the point that you want to kind of push the push the power so again i'm there on the race radio and um yeah talking everyone through it giving them live feedback how many riders are left what should we be doing and um so we're just fast forwarding up on this flat section until we come up to that left hand turn again where we get to kind of the most um, decisive part of the race basically and um yeah Pretty much everyone here. I think Viverke here is um, from uh, Alps and Phoenix. He's there, but he dropped his um, feather power away, feather power up before the climb, which was a bit of a mistake. So this section where it's steepest, that's where you want to drop that because um, your weight's reduced by nine and a half kilograms. So again, here you can see Lionel Sanders, who's guest riding on our team, still pedaling pretty hard, even on the descents. 
again, something you, you don't need to do, and we'll see later on um, where Lino um, goes away, exactly how to kind of ride that bit of plan. Um, again, drops his favorite power up, collects another one under the arch. And uh, yeah, so this is where you'll see Lino knows that um, he's gonna be able to get a bit of a rest. And his heart rate's here, 180 BPM. And you'll watch it, he's now stopped pedaling and he's doing the aero tuck. So his heart rate's now gonna come down to, uh, I think 169 it comes down to before he starts. And again, knowing the terrain, knowing that you're gonna get that little bit of respite is really, really important. And, you know, he's not a serious attack here. He's just, he knows he's gonna get caught uh, by these guys. And yeah, the thing to know is when you get caught by a group like that, is um, yeah, just increase your power a bit so that you don't go get spat straight out of the back. So we're coming back up that climb, coming to the flat section, exactly here. This is where Lionel decided by himself, he's got a ghost power up, it makes you invisible for 15 seconds. He drops it and he goes off the front. So he's doing exactly what we talked about. Amazingly, he did it without having to ask, he just did it. Um, and you'll see that there's a, Vivek is actually in a perfect position here because he's been riding on the front all the time. He spotted the move, so he's going to bridge over um, along with um, Berg, I think, from, from Callus. And um, yeah, so it just worked perfectly. And here he's asking me on the race radio, hey, should I drop back now? And we're like, whoa, you've got like three, four seconds. Just go, see, see what happens. And um, yeah, actually, there's another rider who ends up uh, joining him. And um, it's interesting. So the good thing here is, again, we knew there was a slight descent um, coming down from this section. So it means you can kind of increase that gap. It's already up to six seconds, but you can see here the draft rider, Gaidish, he's, he's going to kind of try and bridge across. He feels that this is going to be the, the winning move. And you'll see he's going to join. And they both, those two riders both drop their drafting power-ups. So that reduces the resistance, which I think is really smart. When you've done that big effort to try and make a, to bridge that gap, is you use that power-up and um, got that little bit of respite. So here, I've slowed it down because there's three second gap here. So normally, in a normal race, you would probably, everyone here is assuming that that gap is just gonna get closed, like without any effort, because um, that happens quite a lot. Um, but nobody, everyone knows they're gonna have to do those three last climbs. No one wants to be the one to force it, to close it. Uh, maybe on a shorter race they would have done, but for whatever reason, this group manages to stay away. So then I'm just like, Lionel, just, just keep going. Don't do any work. Make them do all the work. Then when it gets to the climb, make your move. And you can see that's exactly what he did. He dropped his arrow power up. And that's all he had. You know, feather power up would have been better, but he knows he's going to get another one under this arch. He goes, and I'm like, right, this is it now. You're going to love this because this is going to be a time trial. Um, and obviously, Lionel Sanders is one of the best time trialists in the world. Again, a lot of pedaling on the downhills, which he shouldn't have done. Here, here he's on the second climb. He's dropped a ghost power up which normally you'd be like, well, why would you drop it? But he knows he's going to get another power-up coming under this arch. It's a good time to just throw away a power-up that he didn't uh, need. So now, again, pedaling, didn't have to. The other guys, a lot of them are freewheeling. Now this is the chase group um, chasing him down. But now our guys, I'm telling them, listen, you don't do any work, just sit in. Again, Lionel drops his aero power-up. And normally you would say that for the final sprint, but because I'm like, use it now because you might not be there for the final sprint so use it and that probably was enough um to, to to win him you know or win him the to win the race there was so many different little elements that came together so now we're like well, we're not going to do anything we're going to sit in we know that this swedish guy brenlin is going to want to be the one who wants to steal it at the end um so you'll see the guys they're all basically we're all screaming at line oh come on come on and um they're all just sitting on on wheels but ollie jones being as smart as he is threw his power up, um, his aero power early and sprinted. Now, normally you would never go this this early on a race like this, but he threw it early to try and force Brennan here to go and not give him any drafts. So now he's got no draft. Normally in a bunch of sprint, you want to have as much draft from the other riders as possible. And he's having to do all this effort himself, um, which in the end, it was just too too much to, uh, to close. So tactically, it worked um, to a T and um, We'll just see the results and then I'll show it to you from, from, from Lino's perspective as well, how that kind of sprint worked. Um, but normally when you're doing a sprint like that, you would want to, you don't want to be the first one because people just swarm past you uh, if it's a normal bunch sprint. So which happens a lot on the flatter races. Um, 
So for us as a team, you know, we were able to communicate to one another. We were able to to chat about the tactics, even if if Lionel Sanders hadn't managed to go away. We knew that we'd made everybody else do the work leading up to that. So we had, you know, plan B, C, and D. You can see here we had we had Lena. We came in third. We had Ollie in fourth, and Alex came in sixth. So we had more riders in the top um, top ten than 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 any other team. So we had different cards to play. So that's where being part of a team is hugely beneficial. So now we're just going to see this from 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 Lena's perspective. Uh, for for him, it's. He's left a bit of a gap. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's a tough climb, but he also doesn't want to get in front of, um, of Brenlin here. So he lets him go a lot sooner than he normally would do. So here he just, now he's, he's going to go and he's going to try and if he can beat him, great, but he didn't want to give him any draft at all. And uh, just to, to, to rub a bit of salt in the wound a little bit to his teammate, He's just going to take over Ollie Jones uh, just before the line. Um, yeah, so normally that's not a usual sprint. Normally it would be kind of more of a brunch sprint. And there you want to you want to leave it till about, I don't know, 200, 400, 400, 200 meters. Here you can say he's pretty happy with that considering he came third. So um, yeah, for us, it was a totally um, amazing race. And hopefully there's, there's some tips that you could uh take just from from looking at that and um yeah i just wanted to show you this it's not from the same race but this is a i did a comparison for it was for another race for both um Lino, um did and uh, simon richardson from gcn and we were, we were talking about e-racing and um he was like i looked at their what per kilos uh, at the end of the race and they were the same but Lino would come second and i can't remember where simon was he was way down the results and if you just looked at the data alone, um, some of it, you'd be like, well, it doesn't make any sense. And so his feeling was that he was going straight out the back. And if you look at the power file, you can see just how different they are. Like Simon's is super kind of steady the whole way. As where Lino is more like kind of staccato. He's using the terrain. He knows where he has to put in a bigger dig and where he can relax, where he can use the draft. So it's really obvious when you look at the average power, Simon's putting out only 5% more power across this this the first kind of 12 minutes of this race um, but if you look at the normalized power uh, Lino's actually doing like two and a half percent more and that's because he's 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 putting up these these kind of big efforts and then taking a slight break and that just goes to show the difference between someone who really knows how to race swift and someone who is a really strong rider Simon's a really strong rider but uh, he had just hasn't got the knack of how to do it in the same way. And in the end, if you can save five percent of your your power through racing in this particular way, then it's going to make a make a big difference. So, um, so what next? Get racing. Uh, so the best way to prepare and get good at racing is to is to race. Um, obviously, we have the the RCC championships coming up. Um, so now is the perfect time if you haven't done much racing, just jump into a few other races. There's races happening all the time on Swift. Um, probably you want to pick a flat one to, to start off with, um, which is relevant because the course which you'll be racing on, at least for the qualifiers, is relatively flat. So it makes sense. No point picking a, a, a hilly race. Uh, and just 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 get used to it and try and apply some of the, the tips that um, I've mentioned here. Um, the actual course which you'll be racing on is um, in, the, in those qualifiers. It's not one which you can actually pick yourself. Um, so it's, but it's relatively flat. So this is just a, a, a bit of an outline. So um, yeah, you have a, you have a bit with the S's, you have a bit in the volcano. You can, if you are, if you really want to, you can ride this route, uh, but you have to manually select which direction you want to go to, which is probably too fiddly for most of us. But if you look at the, um, the actual, uh, elevation of the route you can see it's 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 super super flat but there are going to be a few little pinch points maybe where um, you might have to put down a bit more power so um, maybe I would say uh, if you get a chance um, if, you, if you're able to race on the for those of you racing in in Europe um, I would say try and race the one at uh, lunchtime I think which is the uh, the APAC one then you, you can basically you could test it out um, but if not, ride another flat route like um, the Watopia flat route um, and you'll basically yeah, get a feeling for it. So 
Um, but of course, if you're doing another route, um, you, you, you might be able to, to, to ride it. Most of the races occur on routes which are widely available. And um, yeah, you can also go on ZwiftInsider.com. They have every route, they have all the details. Um, they, have the, they link to all of the Strava segments. Um, so you can, you can really study a route. Um, so this is this is where I got this information from. So it's an invaluable resource, not just for routes, for everything. So uh, if you want to learn more about Zwift racing routes, you name it, it's been covered on Zwift Insider. So um, yeah, check it out. So that's oops, that's everything um, with regards to my presentation. So now. Uh, hopefully, Stefan has got here with more than just a towel on, and we'll be able to um, throw some from questions my way. So I'm going to stop um, stop sharing and just go back to the video, and then oh yeah, my mic's fine. So first, I think you need a drink. Eh? This guy. Oh, that's true. Can talk for hours. <laughs> it's amazing. Oh. It's... oh. Man, I love living in Germany. The Germans know how to open bottles of everything. Uh, I already had a beer during your talk, and uh, there were no, or almost uh, no questions for you that I can ask you now. Oh, everything is answered. Oh, okay. Reese, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks everyone for for watching. Um, again, if you, if you do have a question that you think of, feel free to leave a comment. Um, I can check the comments um, like later on and, and tomorrow and I'll reply to you um, uh, personally if there's something which hasn't been answered. Cool, thanks a lot everyone and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. And see you at the RCC Championships. True, I'll be there and so will, so will Lino, so be ready.